Well, the LSU Tigers finally land a transfer at the most important, the number one position of need. But does it really solve all of their problems? You are Locked On LSU, your daily podcast on the LSU Tigers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, what's up, y'all? Welcome into Locked On LSU. Thank you for making us your first listen every single day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts. And do not forget, you can also check us out on YouTube as well. So if you want to watch the podcast and get up-to-date information on the podcast, head to YouTube, hit that subscribe button, and then you'll get notified as soon as new episodes of the podcast drop. My name is Caroline Fenton, and I am your host, as I am every single day. And today's edition of Locked On LSU is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 with any winning $5 bet. So visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. All right, let's get into it because what we've been talking about for weeks and weeks, and it even feels like months, LSU has finally been able to check at least one box off of the offseason list. LSU has finally landed a defensive tackle in the transfer portal. We'll go back all the way to the uh, the spring game, after the spring game when Brian Kelly said, hey, you know, we're looking for uh, for depth in, in, in the transfer portal and we're really only looking at it at one position and that's a defensive tackle. After swinging and missing on Philip Bleedy, the defensive tackle that uh, then transferred to Auburn. Uh, Dominic Williams, who transferred from TCU to Oklahoma, swung and missed on uh, who, am I, who else am I missing here? Thank you, Simeon Barrow. Michigan State transferred to uh, Miami. So LSU is swinging and missing on all of these defensive tackles in the transfer portal. And I said, is it time to panic yet? And I was getting real close to it. Because if Brian Kelly is going to get up at the podium and tell the media that that is their number one priority and number one position of need, and they're focusing their attention, not all of their attention, but in the, the spring transfer portal window, they are focusing their attention on adding depth there. I don't take that lightly. That if the coach says you need to add depth there at that one position, you probably should add depth there at that one position. So LSU lands JVR Suggs, the defensive tackle out of Grand Valley State, in the transfer portal. He made his announcement last night and LSU got in on the JVR Suggs, you know, campaign fairly late within this process. Of course, as we know, LSU is prioritizing some of those uh, higher rated transfers in the transfer portal. Like I just mentioned, Dominic Williams, Simeon Simeon Barrow, uh, Philip Bleedy. JVR Suggs coming from an FCS program, Graham and a division two program not the same caliber of player that LSU was focusing in on. But as we mentioned on several podcasts, after LSU kind of swung and missed at that position, you're going to have to start going down the line. You're going to have to start compromising on certain things. Maybe a player that you wouldn't have originally focused in on in the transfer portal is a player that you now have to focus in on because, one, you're desperate, and, two, Everyone else is desperate in all of college football. Defensive tackle is the number one most valuable and coveted position right now in the spring transfer portal window and three because you just you need bodies there because you needed to add depth. So uh, JVR Suggs, he's six foot three, t- listed at two eighty two. I would say just with that those measurements needs to beef up a little bit. Needs to get probably closer to that three hundred pound mark. Maybe two eighty two would fly at Grand Valley State, and let's be honest, with lesser competition, but JVR Suggs now in the SEC, he's going to be going up against 300, 315, 330-pound offensive tackles. Like, he's going to have to beef up a little bit there. But an, an important thing to point out is when you need to beef up, you also cannot compromise your mobility and your your you know your quickness. So and one thing to focus in on, he was a three-star transfer. And I'm not going to act like I watched a single second of Grand Valley State football. And that's no disrespect to Grand Valley State. But whenever there's a player coming from a program that I didn't watch it much of, if not anything of, I always look at, okay, well, how, how highly was he coveted in the transfer portal? And how heavily was he pursued? Well, looking at JVR Suggs, he had offers from Kentucky, 
offers from Wisconsin, Arkansas, Michigan, USC, Florida State, big time power now four teams. Teams that are in your league in Arkansas and Kentucky. I understand that this LSU program has higher expectations than Arkansas and Kentucky, but still, all of these offers would show me that he's ready to take that next step into the Power Four. He's ready to take that next step into Division I football. And another thing to kind of point out, too, is Florida State's in a very similar position that LSU is in. We talk about how you know losing Mason Smith and Makai Wingo has really decimated that defensive tackle room. Well, Florida State lost Braden Fisk and, J- and Jared Verse to the NFL draft as well. Now, I'm not familiar with Florida State's depth chart, I'll be honest with you, but looks like Florida State is trying to get on the defensive tackle market as well. Another thing to point out here is Grand Valley State. Name might ring a bell to you. Well, it's where Brian Kelly used to coach. It's where Brian Kelly had a lot of success as a head coach and in his early in his tenure as a head coach. It's also where his son plays college football and I can't recall if he has another year of eligibility or not but that's where he's been for the last three or four years I don't know if Brian Kelly's son and JVR Suggs have a relationship so that being said I don't know if Brian Kelly and JVR Suggs had a previous relationship just with him being a teammate of his sons but you know kind of something interesting to look at there that Brian Kelly probably has a knowledge of the program and of the coaching staff perhaps maybe uh, a deeper knowledge and a stronger relationship with that program than some other coach that never won championships there. In 2023, JVR Suggs played in 11 games, had 21 tackles, five sacks, and one forced fumble, uh, and two total seasons at Grand Valley State. If I can pull up the uh, stats right here while they're taking a really long time. I can't pull them up, but he spent the last two seasons at Grand Valley State. Now, here's my evaluation of what JVR Suggs' role is going to be. I don't think he's going to be your consistent starter, every down kind of guy. I think that he's going to be more of a rotational player. He's not going to be a game wrecker. He's not going to be a game changer. He's not going to be a guy that I expect to come out of this season with double-digit sacks or really anything close to it. I expect him to be a rotational uh, starter, uh, a rotational player, rather. I expect him to add some depth to this room. I expect him to add some competition to this room as we get closer and closer into fall camp. Uh, But I don't expect JVR Suggs, just given his history at Grand Valley State, to step in and be a consistent starter and a consistent playmaker for you at the SEC level. Maybe he could. I'm not saying that he can't. I'm just saying I don't know how fair that is to expect of him. But I think a couple important things to point out here is that he's been available largely. He hasn't been hindered by many injuries and he has experience. That's something that you simply do not have in this defensive tackle room right now. Again, he's a guy that you can rotate. He's a guy that you can add into competition. And at this point, you know, you might be saying, oh, really? You know, a guy from Grand Valley State after we were just pursuing guys from TCU and Michigan State. I get it. I understand. There's no sense in crying over Philip Bleedy and Simeon Barrow and Dominic Williams now. Okay. They, they committed elsewhere. LSU, I believe, did everything in their power beside paying them more than what they thought they were worth, worth paying them more than they thought they were, they were worth. Like LSU pursued those guys. They did their due diligence. They did everything that they could. They weren't willing to pay the money. There's no crying in baseball. There's no crying in, you know, don't cry over spilled milk. That's over. That's done. Those guys are going elsewhere. What LSU had to do was pivot their attention to find at least just another guy to put in that position. That's what they found in JVR Suggs. Now, do I feel all of a sudden much better about the defensive tackle room adding JVR Suggs? No, I do not. Let's not get that twisted. My number one concern about this defensive tackle room is the lack of experience. But let's go through that. Let's break down who I believe will be the most consistent rotational players and what I believe will be a little bit of a defensive tackle by by committee this upcoming season. So let's get into that. Let's break down the defensive tackles, what they bring, what they offer, what we know about these players at at an incredibly critical position for LSU coming up this fall. We'll get into that coming up next after just a couple of words from our sponsors. 
All right, I want to tell you about FanDuel. It's winner take all time in the NBA and the NHL. And FanDuel is giving you a shot to bring home a big win of your own. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 to bet on spreads, money lines, player props, and so much more. So if you're looking for something to bet on, I'm looking at the Vancouver Canucks and Edmonton Oilers series in the second round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. Every single game that the Canucks have played so far in the Stanley Cup playoffs has been incredibly gritty, a very defensive forward, very low scoring, even against Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl and one of the best offenses, if not the best offense in the NHL. So I'm going to take the under for game five coming up here for the Canucks and the Edmonton Oilers. I know life's too short to take the under, but with the defense like Vancouver has, it's going to be a slugfest. I expect it to kind of be a, a one nothing, perhaps a 2-1, potentially an overtime kind of game. But hey, that's my take. Do it how you want to do it. Just do it with FanDuel. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make every playoff shot count. Again, that's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. All right, rolling along here on Locked on LSU. Thanks again for making us your first listen every single day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts. And are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? Do you have to turn down the volume with all that shouting? Make the switch to Locked on Sports today. It's a free 24-7 uh, sports streaming channel program for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked on Sports today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Rolling along here, Locked On LSU. The Tigers land JVR Suggs, a defensive tackle from Grand Valley State in the transfer portal. Let's do a deep dive and kind of peel back the layers on this defensive tackle room because I realized that I've been talking so much on the podcast about my concern about the defensive tackle room and how my number one concern is the lack of experience. And I haven't even really laid it out. I haven't even really, you know, discussed it on the podcast of, you know, who those players are, what that rotation is, and really just how little experience this room does have. So now I'm going to break down who I think are going to be the seven go-to rotational guys. Now, of course, things are subject to change. Injury is always going to be a factor here. Injury can happen to anyone, anytime, anywhere, knock on wood. So, you know, you, you account for it for as much as you can. But really, these are the seven guys that I'm taking a look at that I'll, I'm going to keep a keen eye out uh, in, uh, in fall camp. Who's taking those starting snaps? What kind of rotation does it look like? Um, so let's look at it. Let's break down the defensive tackle room. First and foremost, when we talk D-tackle, we can't talk about it without mentioning Jacoby and Guillory first and foremost. Brian Kelly and Blake Baker as well have been singing the praises of Jacoby and Guillory that he's ready to take that next step forward. They have been so impressed with what he did in spring practice. Now, again, spring practice, spring game, take it with a grain of salt. We never get too high. We never get too low on what a guy did in a spring practice or a spring game. But just feel like there's enough conversation about Jacoby and Guillory to feel pretty confident in saying that he's going to be your number one go-to guy. But again, even Jacoby and Guillory, who's going into his fifth year with the Tigers, even though he played in all 13 games last season in some you know capacity and some sort of role, he's only had three starts in four years. You know, that concerns me. Now you're going from being uh, from three starts in four years to now all of a sudden starting 12 to 13 games. That's a really big leap. Not a leap that he can't make. That's not what I'm saying in the slightest, but I'm just saying you're going from asking him to be a role player to now asking him to be the guy. Now can Jacoby and Guillory do it? Can he take that next step forward? Absolutely he can, but will he? That's the question. That's the key. And of course, the second guy that I expect to be in this rotation is Kimo Makaneole. Again, a guy that doesn't have a lot of experience because he just made the move from offensive line to defensive tackle in this past offseason. Can Kimo Makaneole make that move seamlessly? 
Can he make that transition easily and there's no learning curve and he just steps right in and becomes a, you know, a, a, a solid player for you? Maybe. Would I put my money on it? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And I don't think it's fair of him to expect that. Another guy I'm looking at is Jalen Lee. But again, you know, Jalen Lee, he transferred from Florida after the 2022 season. So he spent the last two years at LSU. But again, four starts in four years. That's a problem. That's a concern. Not a problem necessarily. It's a concern. If you're asking him to now make even four starts just this upcoming season, well, that's four times as many that he's been asked in, in his entire career in college. And all four of those starts came at Florida in the 2022 and 2023 season. He played in seven games at LSU this past season, but hasn't played that starting role, hasn't been that starting guy. He's going to have to, by necessity, play a larger role. Sean Washington is another one that I think when we talk about the success of this defense, the potential of this defense, a lot of that is going to swing one way or another as Sean Washington swings. He's such an intriguing case study this upcoming season because he's got the size, because he has the experience. Like He's played a lot of football over the last couple of years, but it's been at the JUCO level. Sean Washington listed at 6'4", 290. I would venture to say he's gotten above 300 at this point. So he's got the size and he's played football. He's played a decent bit of football, but at the JUCO level. The level of competition ramps up times 100 from the JUCO level to what's expected you at in the SEC. Again, I'm not saying any of these players can't. I'm just saying those are my concerns. Another one that I think is very interesting, just given the amount of experience as a good thing, a lot of experience, but also still an unknown on this team and in this league, it's the spring transfer Gio Paez. He had six starts at Wisconsin last year. So already with six starts in one year, it's more than Jacoby and Guillory and uh, Jalen Lee combined in a single season. So you're already off to a strong start there. He's played in 33 total games in four seasons at Wisconsin. So Gio Paez is coming into this room as your most experienced defensive lineman that has played the most football, most consistently over the last four years. Now, I think just that alone already gives him an edge. Him coming in, uh, you know, in power five competition. And look, you look a bit at the Big Ten. I'll make fun of the Big Ten all the time. But if, if they, they don't have you know, good line play on both sides, then I don't know what they got. Like, if you can't give them credit for having just the beef and the physicality in the trenches, my goodness. Like, look at Iowa's offensive line. Look at Michigan's defensive line this past uh, this past season. Uh, I mean, you know, Aiden Hutchinson coming from Michigan a couple of seasons ago. So, I mean, the Big Ten, they're nasty in the trenches now. So I feel like for Gio Paez, just given his experience and where he's coming from, that can be... It can be as easy of a transition as possible. Again, transferring, it's never an easy transition. Learning a new defense, finding your role, carving out that role, finding, you know, your place and your position in a locker room. But still, I think what Gio Paez can become is really intriguing. Finally, Dominic McKinley. Obviously, he's a five-star, the number one player out of the state of Louisiana in the 2024 class, but he's a true freshman. If Brian Kelly needs to play true freshman, he will. But we do know that Brian Kelly has a history of deferring to the guys with seniority. And I don't disagree with that. I don't disagree with that in the slightest. If they need Dominic McKinley, they'll use Dominic McKinley. If Dominic McKinley needs to see the field to be developed and to become you know, his truest, uh, his, his fullest form, then that's what they're going to do. But again, I, I'll reiterate what I said Um about uh, Sean Washington, it's not fair to expect a true freshman. Sean Washington coming in from the JUCO ranks, not a true freshman, but still coming in rather green. It's not fair of me to to ask a true freshman to come in and all of a sudden be the savior for this defense. It's it's not fair. He doesn't have any experience. So while you got bodies, while you have numbers, while you have some intriguing 
names and stories and intriguing players and what they can contribute this season, you don't have a whole lot of experience. I do want to continue the conversation coming up next. I want to take a look at some, some former LSU Tigers in the NFL, some of the latest news around that, and we'll get into that coming up next. All right, thanks again for making Locked on LSU your first listen every single day. A few news and notes and updates on some former LSU Tigers. First and foremost, it was just released earlier this week that the New York Giants will be the Hard Knocks team this year. And I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it, but Hard Knocks, you know, it's a kind of a docu-series that follows a, a team around the NFL as they go throughout training camp. And players are mic'd up, coaches are mic'd up. It's a really intimate inside view and perspective of exactly what goes on in an NFL training camp. So this year it'll be the New York Giants. Why should you care about that? Because I do believe that Malik Neighbors is going to play a fairly large role in uh, in Hard Knocks. I don't know how Brian Dable, New York Giants head coach, is going to approach rookies in um, in Hard Knocks. I don't know how much leeway Malik Neighbors is going to get. I don't know how much free reign he's going to get, how much airtime he's going to get. But I think that's going to be a fun thing to keep an eye on is Malik Neighbors and kind of his getting – you know, his 15 minutes to fame of fame, so to speak, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, because we know it's going to be much longer than 15 minutes, but at least on the big screen and hard knocks, it'll be really fun to get a peek behind the curtain and kind of an inside look of exactly how that transition into NFL life is going for Malik neighbors, but also be fascinating just because, you know, the New York giants are such an interesting team. I don't know if I'm saying that in the nicest way possible, to be frank. Another thing the NFL schedules were dropped on Wednesday night. And first and foremost, you know, hats off to the NFL social media teams for making super creative, really fun, very well-produced videos uh, that they put out on social media. If you didn't get a chance to see the Chargers, if you were a Sims kid like I was, you will absolutely love it and appreciate it. The Patriots video, I think the Saints did a really fun job kind of, you know, poking at, uh, at people on social media. So, you know, first of all, shouts out to those social media teams. But it was also announced that week three, Commanders and Bengals will play. You know, why should you care about that? It's going to be Joe Burrow taking on Jaden Daniels. Jaden Daniels on the road at Cincinnati taking on Joe Burrow. A couple of LSU Heisman Trophy winning quarterbacks. That's going to be such a massive storyline going into that game. That's going to be giving LSU so much great free recruiting content that, hey, if you're a young quarterback across the country, you're a four-star, you're a five-star, you know, you, you have aspirations to play quarterback at that level, well, you can get there if you go through LSU. And that's going to be on full display. So I'm so excited for that. That is week three, Commanders at the Bengals on September 23rd. It's a 7.15 p.m. kickoff. So I believe that is... Monday, or excuse me, Sunday night football. So going to be very, very fun to watch on full display. But that's going to do it for me today. Thanks again for making us your first listen every single day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts. And coming up on tomorrow's edition of Locked on LSU, LSU landed JVR Suggs in the transfer portal. And although I don't think that completely transforms the defensive tackle room or doesn't necessarily alleviate all of my fears about this room, they at least get some more talent, some more experience, and just another body, another depth piece in that room. But LSU still has scholarship space available. They still have scholarships available. So should LSU go after another D tackle to add even more depth? Are there other players in the transfer portal that could add depth to other positions of need? Who are they? At what positions? And who is LSU kind of targeting in the transfer portal now that defensive tackle has at least been taken care of with the addition of JVR subs? We will get into that on tomorrow's edition of Locked On LSU.